if you can leave decent information in a way of something that some people should know, like that you think could benefit somebody, anybody, or something you found majority are struggling with, etc. If you could just leave something, like what would that be? Mm. It's not your fault. Mm. It's really not your fault. In order to break these habits, you are fighting multi-billion dollar corporations. It takes an incredible amount of determination and strength. And you may be completely alone in that battle at times. Yeah, it's not your fault. Like you are, you're addicted and it's not your fault. Not disciplined. You're not weak. You are just addicted. I used to think I couldn't keep or maintain a diet. And I used to have these thoughts that I'm not disciplined, that I'm not strong. I'm just not good with consistency. I had all of these internalizations around why I couldn't maintain certain choices long-term. But it's because no one ever explained to me that I am addicted. Not just addicted to food, but addicted to thinking, addicted to narratives, addicted to my own excuses, my own bullshit. Um, but again, it's not your fault. It is your responsibility, though. If you want to live a good life, if you want to feel different, the only person that can change that is you. And if you really want to make it easy for yourself, you go to the root and the root is the mindset. Thanks for stopping by and having this chat. Thanks for having me. So the most awkwardest thing for me when I do these things is introductions. So usually what I do is I add my own introduction when I go into the editing process. I mean, to not make you uncomfortable, you can introduce yourself if you want. So, um, Britannia. But yeah. So before we done this, we done a quick little breath work and ice bath and here we are today. So cool. You're up. Well, thanks for having me. This is my first time ever being on a podcast. It's that always been a dream nice. of mine. Nice. Definitely not nervous. Talking is like my skill. Um, yeah, it's like one of my secret talents. So I could talk all day. Do we have a time limit? No. Okay, great. I have a feeling that this is going to, could drag on. Oh, could drag okay. On. Well, my dog's in the car, so <laughs> maybe we can edit that out. So people don't think I'm a bad dog owner. Don't worry. All the windows are down and he's in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's um so right i was supposed to introduce myself i'm no, sorry no. so my name is britannia stalinga and i'm the owner founder uh, main facilitator of breathe retreats we run a variety of different kinds of events all with the same theme in mind to in encourage and educate people towards making better lifestyle choices, uh, empowering people to step into fear and discomfort, um, and really just giving people a place to work through whatever it is that they're struggling with. What do you see the most common thing that people are struggling with? Good question. Actually, let me, let me, let me throw a double question at you, right? Mm. So you, you do the retreats, yoga, and the fasting. What is more, like, what is more your thing? Would you say your thing's more the fasting retreats or your thing is more the, the yoga? And out of, say, because you'd probably find a lot more people in the fasting mm. retreats that you've noticed that struggle, what people are dealing with, whether it's food, whether it's, you know, all those types of things. Uh, well, I guess I, I should explain sort of the subjects that we sort of touch on. So the main retreat that I run is a three and a half day fasting retreat. So that we provide juice, but I do encourage people to do a water fast if it's their second time coming back or if they have any experience with fasting uh, or if they're just already living a really healthy lifestyle, they really don't need the juice. The juice is really there as um, sort of a pacifier, an entry point into fasting, just making it a little bit more of an easy experience. Um, but then I also run women's retreats where it's nude. And 
and there's that element. So we're stepping into discomfort through fasting, through ice baths, through nudity, through uh, even letting go of the phone, getting away from technology, being in new spaces with new people, talking about our feelings, being vulnerable. So there's a lot of different ways that you can step into discomfort. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in all of them. Anything that I really don't want to do, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's what I know I need to do. And uh, to answer your question about what I think people are struggling with the most is absolutely 100% mindset. Because I've seen some people that are quite unhealthy in their physical body be able to do great things just because they have an incredible mindset. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing people come away with. Your physical form doesn't change that much in three and a half days, but your mindset can change greatly in three and a half days. Your brain can change a lot quicker than your physical body. Do you think that has a lot to do with like the gut biome and the microbiome of the gut and in a way of like, I, I, I feel that there's like a parasite within, within mm -hmm. us, right? And that parasite can be like an, an entity that, that may perhaps control us, right. Mm. Or may, may have like hijacked the vessel. So I feel that either, you know, depending on what food you eat is depending on what you're, you're sort of feeding. Right. And, mm. and I think that doing those clean, like cleanses, and detoxes and stuff like that, you can move that parasite. And it's like, you're, I don't know. I, I feel like whenever I do it, cause sometimes I do like a five point, cleanse which is like a 16 day ones with just this brown liquid and after it i feel like something something's out of me you know mm -hmm. so um so yeah so is that is that what like is that what you're clearing after that three and a half days is like a sense of like using the word parasite or like what because 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 <laughs> I've, I've done one of your retreats in yeah. september and this is how we met but I've never fasted any longer than I think 48 hours, but obviously because I've done it, I know the benefits, right? And trying to explain it to other people, like of what it actually does is, is, is very, you know, yeah. hard, you know? Um, it's like trying to explain like a trip or a, an outer body experience or a moment of insight or enlightenment. Like there are some things that you can't really explain to people. You can try, which is, I think, what we'll do here today. <laughs> but um, yeah, I forget their original question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I want, I turned the. Is it because I flicked the camera over? No, I think it's because I, uh, I think that there was layered. That was a layered question. So, what was the original? Qu the original question was like you finding what what did you find oh the parasite it's, subject it's, yeah, right yeah. i would never refer to things as a parasite i would only really use the word imbalance so i think fundamentally our bodies and our mind are seeking equilibrium all the time uh also nature every living organism is seeking seeking balance uh and when you feel like a parasite has taken over I just believe that that's the body trying everything it can, sometimes in a manic state, to get back to that balance point. So what I mean by that, speaking of the gut biome, is that if you've put your hormones and your gut biome and everything out of whack by eating a bunch of sugar or intaking a lot of uh, alcohol or even caffeine, you're going to swing in the opposite direction to sometimes come back to that center ground. So. When you are going into a fasted state, you are literally wiping the slate clean and coming back to that center place. We spend a lot of time digesting food and digestion actually takes 70 to 80% of our energy, our focus, our, our brain power. So if you think about it, people live their lives, they wake up. They eat first thing in the morning. They're consuming something from the first hour of their, of their rising day, right? And then they eat, you know, a snack and then lunch and then dinner and then maybe a snack even after dinner. We're spending more time in a digested state than we are in a fasted state. 
Now, what happens in a digested state is that the brain doesn't get full blood supply. In fact, our body is actually pulling the blood supply from our brain and putting it into our stomach so that we can digest that food accordingly. Now, when we're in a fasted state, all of that blood supply that would be otherwise sent to our gut is then put to the brain. This does a number of things. One is repairing brain cells, repairing brain matter, but also another element to that is that you, your brain's functioning. Your brain is functioning in the state it's supposed to be functioning in. You're alert, you're awake, your senses are heightened, uh, you're completely aware. And people are very confused by this concept. They, they have been taught that if you don't eat, you will be sluggish and tired. The reality of that is that is a come down of sugar and refined carbohydrates. If you're eating a healthy, uh, low sugar diet, you won't experience those swings in energy as much. So if you are in a fasted state and your brain is getting its full blood supply, then not only are you awake and alert, but this means that you have the energy to go out and hunt for your next meal. So if the concept of no food equals no energy was true, our ancestors would have just died. They would have gone into starvation mode, not been able to find a hunt or a kill or, or anything to gather with in a few days, and then they would have just fallen asleep in the cave and we wouldn't be here today talking about this. So I think it's really cool to watch people at these retreats, even like people who are a bit obese, people who are a bit older, people suffering with a lot of different uh, medical conditions, people on different medications, they end up feeling incredible, perhaps better than they've ever felt in their entire life after three and a half days of not eating, once they've made it through that withdrawal period of sugar, once they've been through all the symptoms of headaches and, and maybe nausea and tiredness. What's the, what's the headaches come from? Oh, uh, that's just the sugar withdrawal. Mm. So you do like, because most people aren't going from a completely clean lifestyle to mm. fasting, most people are using fasting to detox from their life, mm. to detox from sugar. And when, when you... When you say sugar, are you just meaning like the post, like refined sugar? Yeah, like it's not like, like when you sometimes when you say sugar to people, like oh, I won't have sugar in my tea or I won't have sugar in my coffee. Right. But we can sugar can also be well. You you may not have sugar with your tea, but you're having donuts, right? You know, mm -hmm. or it's like, well, okay, well, I don't have sugar in my tea, and I don't eat donuts, mm -hmm. but I'm still having sugar. So what what other sugar is that? So sometimes, like, I get confused with it. Sometimes I'm like, you know, like when I train for my runs, I have to cut specific foods out. Yeah. And then sometimes people ask me questions on how did I lose weight, and I'll say I say to them like, I oh, cut out the sugar, but then I, I look at it, I think exactly because sugar's in the everything. You know, so sugar. So, what is that? Well, it's not in everything. It's not almost, in whole foods, almost. and it's not in meat. Okay. And it's it, it's in everything that's processed and packaged mm -hmm. with a label. Mm -hmm. If your food is coming from the produce department, you don't have to worry. Fruit is has enough fiber that actually the sugar is digestible in a much different way than uh, refined sugars. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to give you the best example. Okay. So if I give you a banana, a banana has, and I'm all, I don't count calories, but calories is a way to measure food. Okay. It's just one way to measure, correct? If I give you, um, we'll use an apple because an apple can be juiced more than a banana. I think it's a better example. So if I give you an apple, say it's like 120 calories. If I take that apple and I juice it and you drink that juice, it's like 250 calories. Why? Because it's refined. It's no longer the sugar in its whole form that comes in that package with the fiber that you have to chew. You have to take your time. You have to slowly swallow each bite. Uh, and then that sugar that is in that apple is slowly being broken down into your system. If you just take a shot, it's like, can you eat an apple as quickly as you can take that shot? No. It's going to take you 10 minutes to eat an apple. It's going to take you one second to take that shot. 
that sugar is being injected into your bloodstream. So when we think about sugar, we have to think about it in its whole form versus a processed form. If I get a sugar cane and I just start gnawing on a sugar cane, it's much different than having sugar that's been through a milling process and a bleaching process. And same is true for refined carbohydrates. If you get whole grains, they're in its complete package. It comes with all the fiber you need for that sugar to slowly uh, work its way into your bloodstream. Now, if you take that wheat and you blend it, and you refine it into a powder, again, it's like that juice. It's the same concept. It gets into the bloodstream like that. No fiber, no time to digest, no need to chew. It's like injecting yourself with the sugar glucose from the plant. That's supposed to come in its full form with fiber and all the other nutrients and minerals. Does that make sense? You know what? It does make sense, but it's very hard. Like I could never <laughs> explain that to anyone. It, and it's such a confusing, it's such a confusing. Well, what's well. confusing about it? Well, it's not what's confusing. So obviously sh sugar in fruit is, is good. Basically it's not bad, you know, but obviously processed sugar is, is, is bad. So which if, if they're both the same sorts of sugar, you got processed and that. So where is the processed so the processed sugar is that of the sugar you're saying is extracted reduced? from the yeah. plant. So, so if it's, okay. if you, if you take the fiber I, out of what you're consuming, mm. all you're left with is like a hit of sugar. Mm. You need the fiber with the sugar so, for it to digest into the body slowly so that your blood sugar doesn't spike. And with spiking your blood sugar, that means spiking insulin levels as well. That means a crash. That means a craving. We want sugar. Sugar is good, but we want to take it into the body slower. So when we eat that same amount of sugar that's found in an apple, instead of spiking our blood sugar, it's slowly like just balanced, nicely going in, giving us a little energy, giving us little nutrients, but we're not getting these hits, the, these crashes, these cravings. That's the whole point of the whole refined sugar thing, just to yes, not that, spike the blood that sugar. Last, that last little bit made it a lot more sense. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Great. <laughs> because I, I, to me, processed sugar, I think it's, it's not real sugar. It might be like an artificial, like of something, like it's not like, like I never thought that processed sugar would come out of like fruits or sugar cane. I thought it was like a fake thing. Mm. You know, that's what I thought it was. So yeah. But I mean, look, it's it, it, like the last four years I've been sort of running and training and dieting and losing weight. And I've never been able to like understand foods and what it does. To buy. I know, mm. I know by saying, well, if I just cut that, that, that out, but in a way of like breaking it down, you just spoke about it then. Like I wouldn't know you know, and it's mm -hmm. so like you understanding that and speaking about that would be a way of saying, well, you, you know, you could eliminate the risks and the damages, you know, knowing how to avoid obesity or, or knowing how these certain things are caused. But there's a lot of people out there consuming food, thinking that it's good for them, you know, um, uh, probably a better way to for me to say this would be like a lot of us in society have a lot of trust in our food source, right? Mm. Like, like we think like, it's like, we believe news to tell us the truth. We believe that Woolworths is going to give us the right food, but it's like almost everything on the shelves is almost poison in a sense, right? Or, or mm. a way of it's making us sick. And, and there's not many people that know that because we have trust in it, you know? And it's like, you know, it's taken me a very long time to, 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 it's, it's, it's not to see it or to learn it or to understand it. Like it takes some time to actually see, see, see it, you know, like mm. see all of the, like all of the, the badness in the foods and what it can do to the body again, obesity and sickness and, and stuff. And it's like, it's interesting to see as well that um, a lot of the sicknesses and diseases today is all from the foods that we eat as well. And, mm. and, 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 the education around that is, is very minimal in society. And it's like more people need to, to know, right? Mm. Cause we're, we're getting sick. I do think that a part of it is education, but I also very much know personally, and also have experienced having all of the information and still not making the right choices. Mm. 
And that goes back to that point that I sort of made at the beginning where our bodies are seeking equilibrium. So if you are stressed out, you're not going to make always the best decisions for yourself because your body is seeking equilibrium. When you're stressed, your cortisol levels goes up. Do you know what helps cortisol levels come down? Sugar. So a big part of that is like, if you're not taking care of your mental health, the idea that you're going to be able to make good choices just because you have the information is actually not true because you're stressed and your body, it will do anything. Your brain will trick itself, convince itself just to get back to a state of equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get, um, I shame it. Yeah, of course. And then like, I, I it perpetuates ate, it because yeah. then you are shame eating yeah. and then it creates more cortisol and then you feel like even more of a failure. And then it's just this perpetuating cycle. I'll, I'll start tomorrow. It's like, <laughs> I'll start tomorrow. I'll do it all right. I'll do it all again. You know, yeah. one thing I, I struggle with, like, so I, I look at it and I go, okay, I know the lifestyle I want to live, right? The lifestyle I want to live would be like a carnivore, fasted slash plant-based diet and it's sort of like we well, can't do <laughs> those <it>. are opposite <laughs> hey? those are complete opposite well, well okay i know right but it's like but you'd structure it so it's like it allows error and it allows mm -hmm. you to you know so i've i just sort of dive straight in and i go okay well i'm gonna just do this whole plant-based right or i might have a juice in the morning and then i'll go off like onto work Mm. thinking it's going to make me feel better thinking like, or even not eating in the morning and trying fast thinking, okay, it's going to make me feel better. But it, like, it takes time for this to come into effect and, mm. and to play out. But then it's like, as soon as you go out, go to work, it's like, fuck, it's cafe, you know, and it's, you, it's uh, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, like I'll start again tomorrow. It's like, mm. it's, it's very hard to sort of lean into them and actually start. Um, so, so yeah, I try and have like a, a mixed bag of things to do based on my day. You know what mm. I mean? So it's like, well, I might say, okay, Monday I might fast do a 24 hour fast. Tuesday I might sort of just eat clean meat. Wednesday I might. Have just you ever just tried not going, being so, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word intense, but like, have you ever tried just being a little bit gentler and instead of fasting and, ice bath and ultra marathons have you ever just tried for two weeks going for an hour walk as your exercise eating as much as you want no limits on how much you eat but just as long as it's whole foods like meat vegetables and fruit uh have you ever tried something like that well, if I'm not doing the extreme stuff in a way of like, you feel like a failure. Well, it's so the reason I sign up for when I first started signing up for running events, mm. um, it wasn't about my diet and it wasn't about my weight. It mm. was more to the fact of just going, I'm just going to run this event. Right. But then, so, so April, 2019 was when I stopped drinking. So my first running event was in June. So just like not knowing, I just said to myself, well, may I'm just going to cut out specific foods in, in, in a not like, I wasn't thinking that I was training for a running event. I wasn't thinking I was training for a running event. I just like, Oh, I've got this running event. I'm just going to cut out these foods. So that was like soft drink burgers, you know? Um, but back then I wasn't consuming that that much. Like I'd have a cheat day, which was Sunday which Sunday morning I might go and get like a six pack of donuts, a couple of coffees and eat junk. Right. Yeah. But, but the rest of the, the week was quite clean. But if I was to get takeaway, I'd get takeaway. But so anyway, so, so, so that may I cut out all of this food and then I, I ran this 10 K running event. Um, and then the first year of doing running events, um, there was no plan, you know, and, and no sort of strictness in diet, but it wasn't until like, 2020 came and it something like I started to run bigger running events. Mm -hmm. And if I was dieting and training, I'd eat everything on the way home. Right. So it'd be McDonald's and just 
go to 7-Eleven to get the Krispy Kremes, right? Mm. And I was eating everything. But then the next day it would be like a cafe. And the next day, but it'd get to a point where because I didn't drink, so most people would celebrate right. re- rewarding themselves with drinking, I'd reward myself with food. Right? Yeah. So it then lead to um, I'm now eating junk food for two months. Mm-hmm. And I, I look at myself and I reflect. And I go, like I was an athlete. Yeah. Now I'm not. So, so I've got to sign up. Because it's an addiction. Yeah. It's like, so it's it's like this whole eating a six pack of donuts on a Sunday. It's like, oh, I've been clean off mm-hmm. drinking for a whole month. I'm going to go get shit faced at the bar. Mm-hmm. Sugar does the same thing as drinking as cocaine. It is an addiction. So the idea that you should be able to have one cheat day a week, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. If I do that, I'm right where you are. Exactly what you're explaining. I'm back to the addiction. And then I I have a hard time. It's like going through detox. Again, every time I do that reward system binge eating thing, I'm now back to square one, maybe not in my physical form, but I feel it. I'm getting the cravings that are really strong. I have very little willpower, no energy in the morning, mood swings, not very good sleeps. All that comes back like that. Mm. Doesn't matter how long you've done it. Yeah. And it, it, because it is a drug and we don't think about that. Mm. We don't look at food. I don't even really like to call anything with a label in a package food because it's not food. It's a product. Have you seen that um, someone shared something to me the other day? The Tim Tams have this thing, ingredient called cochineal, which is an insect. Oh, I wouldn't be scared of eating insects. I'd be more scared of the freaking chemicals that are in yeah. that. I'd eat, I'd eat bugs over a Tim Tam any day of the week. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it is like some culture, you know, like crickets and grasshoppers. I mean, if you look at paleolithic beings, a good portion of their diet was bugs. Who are the paleo? Uh, so anybody that lived sort of like a paleolithic being was like when we were cave people, hunter gatherers. Yeah, I, bug bugs are cool. Yeah, well, you know, to go back to the the running thing again was um, that uh, with the extremes of the dieting and signing back up for a running right. event was to, was to to go back to who that person was, but. I, the the last run I ran was in October and I said to myself, I'm not going to go back to eating the food. I'm not going to go back to eating the food. I'm not going to mm-hmm. go back to eating the food. Found myself December, January, slipping down into that thing. But, you know, coming out of this next one I've got, because I've got one in May. Yeah. That I will try and just do, the next, you know, I will, <laughs> I will try and just, you know. So I, I've brought this new sort of thing into my own personal life, my practice around uh, food and my relationship with hunger, because um, I've, like most people, I've spent a lot of my years, you know, using food as a coping mechanism for loneliness, for stress, uh, to go to bed at night. That was a big one for me. I actually didn't feel tired until I would eat. Um, and obviously eating right before bed is not ideal. Uh, so I started doing this in the last couple of years no one taught me this. It's just something that I've picked up and I've, I'm only really acknowledging this thought pattern kind of as of recently, where instead of having like this intellectual idea of this is what I want to do, this is what I'm going to do. These are my goals, writing everything down, making these strict lists. I really want to be able to make those decisions kind of naturally because the structured approach just never has worked for me long term. I get unmotivated after a while, or it just seems like I'm boxed in and restricted. And then that makes me want to lash out, or I do really good. And then I want to reward myself. Right. And the idea is, is that I want to reward myself. The reward is feeling good. So I've done a lot more, uh, I've paid a lot more attention to how I feel when I eat those foods. So when I have a moment where I binge eat or I eat a whole, you know, I mean, I've never eaten six donuts before, but say that happens, you know, then I, I will get, take, I think I've got an eight pack. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a moment and I'll, I'll acknowledge how I'm feeling like, oh, I feel jittery. Oh, I feel like a little out of breath. 
I feel sluggish. Oh, I, and then throughout the day as well. Oh, I couldn't sleep. Like that's a big one for alcohol consumption. My sleep is terrible. If I drink and go to sleep, I just toss and turn. I wake up in hot sweats. It really affects my sleep. So if we start to ignore, do you drink, do you drink now? Do you I do drink. Yeah. I, do, I don't not do anything in my life. That's a big part of who I am. I don't have any fixed boundaries. Um, I just do what I want if it feels right. But that's a part of the process of going from structured thought process, eating meal plans, calorie countings to an intuitive eating. And in order to be an intuitive eater or an intuitive liver and, <laughs> and to tap more into your intuition and your body is observing how you feel. That's so, it. sorry, let me just close this thought up. Yeah. Is that if you observe that you feel shit every time you do something, eventually, and maybe it's not going to happen after the first few weeks, but eventually when you go to pick up that six pack of donuts, you're going to remember how it made you feel. And you're going to be like, mm, do I want to feel like that? I want those donuts, but I don't think it's worth it because I have taken a moment to remember and to register how that makes me feel when I eat it. Same with alcohol. And you've done it with alcohol. Yeah. So if you've done it with alcohol, you know alcohol makes you feel like shit. You've taken the time to remember how that makes you feel. And then eventually you just don't want to do it anymore because you, your body, like I said, equilibrium is genuinely wanting to feel good genuinely wanting to find harmony and balance. So observing how you feel is such a life hack for changing patterns. Yeah, I, I could, um, if somebody was to ask me now, would you have a drink or could you introduce drinking back into your life? I could tap into that feeling mm. of, of what it would make me feel and sort of like visualize what would happen, you know, like if it was say a Thursday night or a Friday night, I, I, I know, and I could feel everything that I felt in the past mm -hmm. where it could mm -hmm. lead to a bender. It could lead yep. to like a long, you know, I'm still drinking Sunday afternoon for two yep. minutes. Right. So I can feel that and I get that and then but it I don't get, I can't get like that with food, but that would be very good if I could, because a lot of my inner talk is, ah, fuck it. You know, it'll be okay do it tomorrow. Like you failed today. You failed today with your diet. Like what I was saying before about the mm. bastard, you know, carnival, da, 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 all, all of that, like put so much strict pressure on myself to live a certain way, but I'll fail really quick. And then it's like, I get that fuck it attitude. It's like, okay, mm. well, I'll introduce all of these foods that I know is not letting me live the life that I want. And it's not until the night, like the nighttime when I reflect back and I think, shit, I should have been training today. I should have done this. I should have done that. And I'm like, God damn it. If I just mm. didn't make that decision of going, yeah, I got those Krispy Kremes or I went to that cafe when I could have just starved myself in a, in a sense, not starved myself, but I could, I could have gone without eating. Right. You know what I mean? Like I didn't need to eat, could have just ate at night, you know? And it's like, it'd be good to be able to actually sit there consciously and just go, oh, like I know what's going to happen, but I never do that, you know? Mm. So that's, um, yeah, that, that's something very good to take away from, from that, of what you said, you know, being just having that awareness around it of, um, you know, how would my future self feel? But actually the last couple of weeks I have bought some foods uh, or I have, you know, done some stuff where I, I know what, what's about to happen and I've paid for it and it's like, throw it away throw it away, throw it away. Mm. and it's like not even care, like I wouldn't even care if I was wait if I spent $30 on food or 60 or $70 it's not the fact of going you're about to throw $70 of food away mm. like it's like oh, you're gonna enjoy it you're gonna like it you know so lately actually I have been getting like that where I've almost thrown food away mm. well um, that's been that's a very interesting concept because there's a lot of people who are taught as children and I definitely was one of them that you must finish the food that's on your plate mm. and I just had like this realization come to me not too long ago actually I can't remember where I heard it 
was that whether you eat it or throw it in the bin, it's still wasting. If you consume more than what you need, it's waste. So it's either that waste is going into your body, like you're the garbage pit, or the waste is going into the bin. You've spent the money. It's already more than you need. So it's already wasted. So now when I'm finished a plate of food, when I'm full, that's it. I don't feel this like nagging little voice inside my head being like, finish all the food on your plate because there's starving kids in Africa. You know, the way that my mother used to tell me. Now I'm like, actually, I can throw food away and it's okay because if I eat it, it's not, it, it makes zero difference. The only person it makes a difference on is me and my health. So now I'm actually in the process, practice of trying to actively always leave a few bites of food on my plate because I, I think that there's a level of scarcity that comes and um, the scarcity mindset that comes with, oh, you have to finish everything because it's wasteful uh, that I don't want to be a part of and I don't want to give into and I don't want to pressure myself to, to have to live up to that standard of consuming all weight. P- things are wasted every day. I'm, you know, the world isn't going to be a better place because I, yeah, because I eat yeah. all of my I, food on I, my plate. <laughs> sometimes I, I, I do throw food away and think about those starving kids in Africa. And sometimes I think, should I be freezing all of this and we have some form of community where it's like, I, I mean, look, I'm not saying, well, am I saying this? I think I am saying this. Would I freeze all of my food and then one day of the week give it to homeless people i mean honestly homeless people here in australia wouldn't don't. want your frozen leftovers they're bougie <laughs> they probably prefer a pack of cigarettes right? yeah. i remember i you gave know? 50 i remember i gave 50 dollars to a homeless person once when i was i used to go and get my car washed and then walk across the road and go into the shopping center i don't know what i'd get it was regular pattern i'd always do it on a sunday morning but i remember i went oh, i'd go to the coffee club i'd go to a cafe um but i remember on my way past i gave this guy 50 dollars, mm. and then when i came back he had a, uh, a like an oak milk or like a um, not oh, a, the chocolate no, milk like, like a dare, you know like a dare like a yeah, dare yeah. chocolate milk. so he had like a dare a dare milk and then like a i think 30 pack or 50 pack of cigarettes. I think it was a 30 deck of cigarettes. So mm. gave him $50. And I think back then this would have been 2018, 2017, roughly, you know, maybe $30 for cigarettes. So he literally spent 70% of that on cigarettes and, you know, um, as he should, his body's trying to, he needs that dopamine to bring those cortisol levels down. Being homeless ain't easy, you know, <laughs> yeah, <I feel laughs> and he's like- probably healthier for it because he's fasting most of his life. You know, yeah, yeah. if you eat one meal a day, you'll live forever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah, uh, I was going to actually ask. So what would you like? I don't calorie count either. And, and I don't understand calorie. I don't get it. Like, um, one of my friends runs a supplement store mm-hmm. and he always says to me, oh, track your calories and da, 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 do this and do that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know how many calories in, are in a blueberry. I don't know how many calories are in my, my breakfast. Right. But, um, uh, what was I saying? What was I kind of saying? Uh, oh yeah. So sometimes my average daily calorie intake might be 2200 calories. Right. Um, some people say that it's good to, if your, your, your daily average is 2200, like even if it's like 1800 and you're in that calorie deficit to lose weight. So meaning that you actually, no, I'll say it this way. If you're 2200 calories consuming, but you're, you're burning 2600 calories. So you're in that deficit of 400 calories, right? So am I making sense? Yeah. Do you know where I'm, Okay. So would you say that an average like daily amount would be around that 2200 in calories if you understand what i'm saying with average you, amount for what just what for people, everyday people like are we eating, like what are, people are eating well like so in a in a way i think i'm asking as a species are we are we eating too much yes yeah so <laughs> yeah, so definitely. really we shouldn't be eating 2200 calories maybe it's 1500 well, it depends. I don't think there's a should. It, it's like if you're training hard, yeah, some people yeah. should be eating that much. Mm. Um, but if you've got an office job, 
and you're five foot five, 150 pounds, there's no need for you to have 22, whatever amount you just said. Um, but it's interesting because you know, this hard, like the way that you gave up alcohol, uh, you can just go cold Turkey, right? But you can't do that with food. And that's why it, it calls upon such different kinds of skills and practices that are a little bit more gentle, a little bit more balanced. That's why learning how to go slow and just walk for an hour every day, you're still getting exercise, you're still burning fat, you're still getting your heart rate up so that it's, you know, good for heart, uh, cardiovascular, but you're not killing yourself so that you crash. You're not going so hard that you feel like you deserve a reward. You're just doing enough to make sure that you're maintaining all the things you need to maintain. Um, you can't cut food out the way that you do, um, like alcohol. Like alcohol. So you're going to have to learn people, not just you, everyone has to learn to have a relationship with food. It is a relationship. You can't just cut it out. So it does mean, you know, what, what do you do in a relationship? Sometimes you need space from your partner. And when you take that space, it makes those times when you're together a lot better and you appreciate the time more. Uh, so same thing with food. Like if you're only eating one meal a day, the chances are you're going to really honor that meal and you're going to choose better foods. It's a bigger, it's a bigger reward as well. It's a like bigger that, reward. Yeah. It's like you, you have, deserve, like you deserve that. Like you put in the work. Well, it's, I don't know. I think like the reward deserve thing. I think it gets a little bit tricky because. Well, I think in a way of like a, a, an ancestral sort of tribal way, it's like, you know, like, uh, or hunter gatherers, right. Where mm. like their reward was, was the, the, the victory of the hunter or a successful hunt. Yeah. Right. So that, so that's the reward. So in a way of like being like that, it's like, well, the reward is you do everything that you need to in the day, you know, like, all of the tasks that you put out for yourself, whether you do train, whether you don't, or whether you want to go for that walk or just everything. But sometimes like, the reward is, is being hungry. Some like, that's why I don't like the idea that food is the reward. I get what you're saying. I do. I do. And I don't think that it should be discredited that the idea that we need to earn our food, I get that in our modern day society where people aren't earning their food at all. And it's just given to them on a silver platter in abundance. This concept does make sense. When you say abundance, what do you, what do you mean by it's everywhere? Time? There's yeah. no shortage of food. There's no lack of food. There's cafes at every corner. Um, if you're hungry, you can always get food. There's, the accessibility is, is abundant. I hear a lot of people use the word abundance. I don't, I don't, I, I like in the context that they may not just think hmm, abundance yeah, isn't always great. Well, like abundant of food in our society is not, it's not. Well, I hear a lot of people do it in like a, their morning practice or their daily routine. They'll use it as like a bit of a mantra, but they'll add something to it, you know, or something like gratitude practice, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, I just hear it on so many different examples and I, I actually feel I actually know what it means. It makes me feel what the silly. actual word abundance. Just, just the word, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, well, we should look to... it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should Google it. Abundant. It just means like an um more than enough, like a yeah, yeah, like a good supply, yeah. a healthy, uh, like um, probably more. I think abundance is probably linked to more than enough. I don't know. I've never actually looked up the definition. Yeah, yeah. Now I remember my friend once said that. Um, I think I was talking about like population and sustainability mm. for the planet, you know, like is the, can the planet sustain this amount of population? We're talking about all these things. And, and he said that you'll find that if we all were to spread out, you know, that there's, there's abundance of, of food and sustainability out there for everyone in a way of saying, well, we're not overpopulated. We're underpopulated because there's abundance of everything. And I was just like, Oh, well, I just think that, the earth probably can't maintain so many people consuming so much. If we were consuming a normal, healthy amount that wasn't over the amount that we need to survive and live, I think that the, the earth could support billions and billions of people for long periods of time. Unfortunately, we are living way above our means. We are eating way more than we need. 
buying way more, traveling way more, just everything is, yeah. Like one, one millionaire has the same emissions as like an entire country uh, or not millionaire, billionaire, I should say. So I don't know all, all that stuff on their private planes and stuff. Is that what you mean? Like, yeah, but I mean, I I can't really speak on any of that because I, it's not my it's not, not my not it's not my we're area not of expertise. The only thing that. that I really know about is nutrition um, and the benefits of fasting, movement, breath work, all of that yeah. combined. Your um, when I done the retreat in September, your your yoga history, um, you. Uh, done it in India. Is that right? You've done Yeah. It? Yeah. So when I first got into yoga in 2018, the, um, the teacher in that class, she'd done like 500 hours and mm. um, it was like, it's not, it's not the Himal Himalayas. Is the Himalayas in India? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So also it, in Nepal, but yeah, it might've been like Nepal, India, and Himalayas. China. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't think it was there. It was definitely, so it's definitely in India, but it yeah. was like, I was like, but I tell, I, I noticed the difference, right? I noticed the difference to someone um, when they teach like that, rather than, you know, mm -hmm. someone that sort of does it through. A Anyone can go to India and get a 200 hour teacher training. But you notice a different, you notice the difference. So in those. That yeah, but gone, that's not from India. I mean, my Indian experience was great, uh, but that's not why I'm a good yoga teacher. I'm a good yoga teacher because I've been practicing for 25 so you don't years. Think that, that like the practicing going over there is different to the practicing here. Mm, I would say the bulk of my knowledge was not from India. So, so what are you learning over there? You're learning. I actually learned more of the non-physical stuff, the meditations, the chanting, uh, waking up really early, Ayurvedic cooking. Uh, the actual physical practice, asana, uh, that all of that is, you know, I've trained with some of the best teachers in the world, uh, you know, back in Canada and also in India as well. But you have to, you have to keep in mind when you practice with someone for a month or two weeks, it's like, there's only so much that you can soak up. That's why I say the bulk of my knowledge is from the 20 years in Canada where I was practicing diligently, not the one month in India. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I look at it as a, to me, I feel like it's a big deal. It's not a big deal to you. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, little so it shows a little I know. Well, anyone can go to India for $200 feel, teacher training, but not everybody can practice consistently for 20 years. Yeah, how, That's many hours, why. how many hours did you do over there? couple of few oh, I did I did two 200 hour trainings yeah, so, so technically 400, 400. 400 right yeah um I just know that whenever people have said that they've been to India to do yoga training mm. I've noticed the difference in in the class but I also think maybe just maybe just putting this out for devil's advocate maybe the people that go to India are people that are just more connected to the practice and more diligent and that's why they've chosen India you know it, I think if you get deep enough into that yogic practice, you want to go to the motherland. But if it's just sort of a side hobby, it might not be as important to you. What's the, you said, as, as, asana? Asana. asana yeah. Ah, okay. So this what, is important. You should know this as yeah. a yogi. Oh, I want to know because <laughs> like, it, uh, you know, like some of the postures. Um, in, asanas, like, some of the asanas. Got, that means uh, posture. Uh, uh, good. I'm learning. Uh, good. No, no, no. Because <laughs> this is this is something I struggle with, right? So, um, the the names for the movements, right? So it's not like arrowhead. It's not crow pose. It's not. There's these other names. Yeah. The and these are the traditional. Yeah, the Sanskrit names. names. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So and they're called asanas. Asanas, yes. Other postures. Yes, yeah. which means seat. It means that's the exact translation from Sanskrit. Yeah. But so you'll have like a Paschimota Nasana uh, Asana. So they all end in Asana. So a uh, Navasana, Paschimota Nasana, Utkatasana. Like they all end in Asana. Also, what did you say? Oh, I was just naming different postures. Um, Utkatasana, seated chair pose. Yeah, because I know that when when you go when you do like the sun salutations and yeah. you do and you go into like the um, your hands up and then you come down and you sort of go into that 
the the um what's it called when you, you before you go into the the half lift um when you touch your knees you, but you forward fold forward okay. fold yeah forward, forward fold and you come up and then you, then you hold your knees but then like when you go down into that um down not chaturanga down, Chaturanga, yeah, but when you say all of that whole combination in the in the asanas, Urdhva or, Mukha Svanasana, yeah, Adho Mukha Svanasana, yeah, but when, when, but when you go through that flow, right, because yeah. you go into that, um, uh, what is it, up dog, down dog, yeah, yeah, but the and then into Chaturanga, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you go in through that whole flow, and then you're like into Chaturanga like that, yeah, and, and, but you hear all of those names as you're going, you know, it, it's just such like just this crazy experience <laughs> you know and hearing it hearing it that way right and yeah just, um, i agree yeah. i agree like yeah. it I tr traditionally ashtanga which is i would say my primary style that i have practiced and been trained in uh they when you're of course this isn't all like entry level classes won't do this but if you're doing a primary series with a, a lead primary series your teacher will be speaking the whole class in Sanskrit. And what's really, really interesting about that is that when I say certain words in English, you already have associated memories with each word. So give you a broad example. If I say down dog, if you have a fear of dogs, perfect that. Yeah, if sure. if you have a fear of down, uh, sorry, if you have a fear of dogs and I'm saying down dog through our practice because you understand that word that word lights up certain receptors in the brain there can be almost like these weird emotional ties and things that come up in the practice when you're speaking in english but when you only speak in sanskrit there's none of that and you can really drop into this really different meditation this moving meditation pratyahara the withdrawal of senses so yoga is really looking to heighten the senses in its first step uh, to be very aware to use the gaze to be very connected to the sensations but then eventually it's to withdraw from the senses so you're not really even there you're not thinking you are literally just moving but your body's sort of doing it without your brain without your knowledge where you're meditating as if you're in a seated meditation but your body is doing handstands and all these crazy things yeah um yeah um i don't know where that came from or, no, 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 or no, how we no, went no. from nutrition and fasting no, to no, that but no, no, I, want, I want to um uh because uh the i've done like probably maybe like three yoga classes from like 2012 20 2011 2012 2013 mm -hmm. and it was just like you know whatever like it, it was it was it was nothing right um and then in 2018 i there's just this whole story about how me and my friend at the time, my friend was already doing yoga. Um, but he was like doing it for like six months before I did should just share the story rather than cutting in and you get, you get where I'm going, but <laughs> I won't go long winded into the story, but there is, there's this, there's this story that's just mind blowing of how we ended up going to our first yin class. Right. Okay. Um, and you know, we went to this, this one studio and it was like in a gym and you could hear all like just people kicking the punching bags in the other room. And it was real noisy and music and we're just on the floor and it was just like dirty and like, just, it was just horrible. Mm. And, but we left this class and we drove past this other studio. I, I said to my friend, I'm like, Oh look, there's, there's a yoga, like a yoga studio. So we just charged on in. <laughs> it was, it was like half clothes and I'm like eating food at the end of it. Right? Anyway, just sort of like just barged in and, Anyway, they said like come down. It's Friday night, and um, uh, just you know, come for this class. We got this seven day free trial. So anyway, they said like come like ten minutes, fifteen minutes early to sign this waiver, and um, so so like how I was conditioned and how I was you know running my life back then. Like it was just very tense and very like like stressful and stuff like that. Where I'm saying to my friend like. You know, get to my house at five to six we got to be at the you know be at this place for 10 minutes beforehand it's going to take 15 minutes to get there and stuff so i'm like giving him like this schedule to get to my house anyway he turns up like five past six 10 minutes late hop in his car and his petrol lights on 
and it's saying he's got like less k's in the car to like than the distance that we need to to get to the studio and i hopped in the car and i'm just all tense and i'm just like stressed like i'm just like why like that anyway we go to the petrol station put some money in we get to the studio we're like we get there at 6 25 class starts at 6 30 but again they wanted us to be there 10 minutes early for the waiver the whole way there was just so stressful and my my mind was just like fuck it like fuck it just turn the car around like just fuck it fuck it fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. and i was just mm. ah, da, 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 like 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 that mm. right and um i done the class and we drove off and i turned around and looked at him and all of that before it had just just gone mm. and everything flattened out and i looked at him and i was like I was like, whoa, man. I was like, do you feel that? And then he, he like, he looked over at me and he just sort of like nodded his head, you know? Mm. And I was like, oh, there's something, there's something about mm. this, you know? And, but that, that was a yin class, right? And then, you know, from what I learned from, from yin and how it opens up the hip, hip flexors and it relieves mm. a lot of stress and just getting that mind body balance and, and the benefits out of it mm. sort of put me on this whole, like, like, you know, not saying anything in regards to mental health and being medicated or anything like that, but it's more like saying, well, um, like this is the cure. This is, you know, like you don't need to take a any depressant tablet every day. You just need to do yoga once a week. And that that is all that is all we need, right? So happiness is not that complicated. No. Nah. People think it's really complicated. Their life goal is to be happy. I'm like, there is a recipe. I just want to win. There's a fucking recipe, people. It's literally maybe five ingredients. You just do it every day and you're rewarded. It's not complicated. People think they're so different. It's like when you tell somebody, oh, all you need to do is exercise more and eat less to lose weight. And they're like, no, I've tried. That doesn't work. Have you really? Yeah. Yeah. They'll try it for like half a week. We are all the same. <laughs> yeah. We are all the same. It's not, it's not, you don't need a special ingredient list for you it's like we all just need to spend time in nature breathe slow down and quiet our mind and we don't get a lot that's of opportunities I, to do that that's what i found with the yin yeah the yin so so let me ask you something yeah. let me ask you something so you came out of that yin okay that yin wasn't an ultra marathon it wasn't anything like that it wasn't making you fitter or stronger or anything like that not in your physical body well it technically was but we'll just stick with the idea that it wasn't giving you any fitness because that's what the mainstream media would have you believe but we can touch back on to that later let's just go with that theory for a moment for the for this point yeah so embody that sensation You've come out of yin and you're feeling calm. That chatter monkey mind is gone. You're breathing into your belly. Your shoulders have dropped. The squished bit in between your eyebrows has relaxed. You're talking a little slower. You feel different. Now, do you think you could feel that way and then desire going and binge eating? Exactly. Exactly. This, this is it. When we put ourselves in a stress state, we make other decisions to counterbalance that stress. If we maintain a calm breath, a calm, clear mind, we will always make the right choice. And if we don't, we will be very quick to realize and not do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And this is like, I, I understand that a lot. And this is what I was saying with, with the parasite, you know, like mm. um, in, in breaking it down and yeah. And using the parasite or the gut biome to, yeah, to, mm. to translate that. Does that make sense? Does, does that, does yeah. That well, sense? Yeah. it's so, it's so interesting because, you know, <laughs> if you had told me two years ago, and actually, well, maybe a little bit longer than that. I I was asked, I was actually asked this question maybe four years ago. I was asked the question, do you think that your emotions have an effect on your physical health? And four years ago, I said no. 
Now, what has got me to the point now where I believe that your mental health kind of is an indication of your physical health? It's almost like that's the the uh, what the, the root the root of your physical health is your mental health. The reason that I believe that it took a little bit of science and probing, but the when you start to dive into the neuroscience around this, which is so great that we have these studies being done now, uh, they show you that stress equals cortisol. Cortisol will make the body crave sugar, dopamine to balance out that cortisol. So when you start to actually learn that there is scientific proof that your mindset and being stressed out is going to have an effect on every decision you make, from the food you eat, the partners you choose, the jobs you stay in, how you sleep, how you think, how you feel, then all of those choices will then affect your finances, will affect your physical health, your body weight, how clear your skin is, all of those things. What does it all boil down to? Your mental health. And I never acknowledged that until science told me, oh, there's a connection. Oh, when you go in an ice bath, your body does all these things, produces these hormones, which leads to this, that, and the other. So I had the science. And then now I realize I don't even really need to know the science. All I need to do is intuitively look inward. I don't need to know that sugar spikes my blood sugar and leads to more cravings. You don't need to know that. All you have to do is take time after every single thing that you do to become aware. Okay, how did that bath make that cold bath make me feel? Okay, how'd that food make me feel? So it, it's a constant observation. And observation and awareness is the very opposite to living in a non-conscious state of being, which is kind of the issue that we have with civilization. So many people living unconsciously, so many people being ruled by their addictions and their feelings rather than uh, their higher state of consciousness, their deeper yeah. knowing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all clouded. Mm. But anyways, we're getting there. Yeah. More podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> more ice baths, yeah. more yoga, yeah. more whole food. Yeah. You know? it, it, it's so um it's so weird. It's uh like there's something there's something happening with a shift with a lot of people. And it's, I don't know, like there's so many different words to describe certain things that are going on, right? Um but uh, you know, people use the words like an awakening of such, and mm. some people think that an awakening might be information. Well, well, actually, no, sorry, different forms of information, right? So a, an awakening of a way of learning the benefits of an ice bath or learning the benefits of sauna, like, cause it's like, it's like a switch has been flicked and it's coming out now. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I get it that it's probably always been there and we're just in this mm -hmm. age of the internet and we can just get access to yeah. information, you know? Um, I can't think of that guy, like Huberman. Oh, Andrew Huberman. Huberman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's so, great. so like, you know, what I know about ice baths and saunas is basically pretty much the repeating of what he says, but I don't get it, but I just say, oh, that these benefits are heat shock proteins and, and heat shock uh heat shock proteins and cold shock proteins right but like the 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 deeper information about it, I, I don't know you know what i mean but um but yeah like you see people like that come out now and and speak about it you know so it's it's there's, there's so many tools that are out there and it's like coming out in an age of like now yeah like, well he's he's really saying a lot of what ancient yogis have been saying since the beginning of time, but he's just using different language, the science language, which is more respected in our day and age and easier for us to sort of comprehend with our logical minds. Um, but ultimately, like you dive into the discomfort has been a theme of religious practices for years and spiritual practices for years. Like if you if you really hate the cold, the sure. thing, go in an ice bath yeah. and your body actually will manage the cold better and you won't, 
you won't feel the cold as much. But if you don't like something, we resist it, right? Where the medicine is actually diving into that discomfort, facing your fear, turning over those those yeah, leaves. Like- with the ice baths it's like the thought you hate the thought of it right you know and it's like i the first few i i went in like at the beginning it was um not here like you know outside of my house it was like my inner voice was screaming like yeah ah, like and it was just creating all of these problems that like now it's it's just off you know mm. and it, you just get in like today you know i don't know like that first minute, just pushing past that first minute, I didn't really get that I needed. You know, like when you're just like, I just got to get past it, just got to get past it. And you hear someone say, minute 20, you're like, oh, good. Like I'm almost yeah. there. Like I the used first to, couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. Are you, like I used to sort of get like that, but today, like sitting in it, it's like it was just that in a scream had stopped like that. Ah, you don't want to be in it. Yeah. Just, Whatever. Yeah. This yeah. sucks, but it's going to be over in three minutes. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. I'm going to feel great for the rest of the day. Who gives a shit, yeah, you know, yeah. same with being hungry. Like, uh, so I had, uh, a few nights, like Bonnie and I, my good friend, Bonnie and I went out, she's here from South Africa. So we went out, we had a few cocktails, we had some food from the restaurant and ob- it's, it's sugar. So the next day I'm hungry first thing in the morning, even though I fast every day. So then I know, okay, I'm sitting, but I, because of that awareness practice that I told you about, I have such a different relationship with my hunger. I actually recognize my hunger as a good feeling now, which is took a bit of time. Um, but I, it's because I compared it to feeling full. And when I eat, even if it's actually, even if it's healthy food, When I eat, that hunger in my stomach goes away, but the alertness in my mind also goes away. And when I'm hungry, there's a little bit of discomfort in my belly, but I am alert and I am switched on. And yeah, I can't go sprint all the time because my blood sugar will drop or I'll get a little bit like lightheaded, but that forces me to also just move slower and more consistent and be more mindful of my breath. So I have this relationship now with my hunger where I'm like, this is a teacher, makes me feel light. It gives me energy. It slows me down, but also gives me energy. So it's like this really beautiful, balanced feeling. And when I do things like drink alcohol and eat a bunch of food out with Bonnie, I know that not only am I not sleeping that night and not only do I feel bloated that evening, but also the next day I'm starving all day. And it's not as easy for me to move through the day as I normally would. What are you getting, what are you getting out of that, uh, not environment, but like that, that place of welcoming drinks? Like, like, why are we drinking? You know what I mean? Yeah, good question. Is it like, am I doing this to go out to drink or am I doing this to go out and enjoy company? Am I doing this Mm. because I like the feeling of the drinking? Like, like, why are we bringing it in as a way of like, like socializing if, you know, I know that. To me, it's well, I do like drinking. Yeah, I like how I feel when I drink. Uh, I don't, but, but, the yeah, only reason it's not a part of my everyday life is because yeah. of how it makes me feel the next day. That's yeah, well, that's what I mean. That's so, the only reason you know that and you're aware of it, but you're still, but I still partake because, um, sometimes you you can sacrifice one day of your life not feeling a hundred percent for some things. Like, I don't really have such a terrible relationship with alcohol that I feel I need to give it up cold turkey. I do feel I can enjoy it every once in a while. Yeah, okay, the next day is not going to make me feel 100%, but whatever. Yeah, it affects so many different Not feeling 100% is also okay. And and I can, I'm, I'm also used to not feeling 100% and still going through my day. Yeah, it affects people differently. It does, it like, does. I, I hear people screaming saying, it is poison. It is so bad. You know, there is no medicinal per- use to alcohol. Like yeah. smoking marijuana has medicinal purposes. If you can't go to sleep at night, if you have, um, you know, if you have a hard time eating, if you are nauseous, there's a lot of medicinal use for weed, none for alcohol. Mm-hmm. So I am very aware that it is a drug. <laughs> that I, I, but I also eat burgers every now and then. Okay. <laughs> I know people that say that they drink because it settles their anxiety. And I just think that it does temporarily. It does temporarily, but but it's temporary. And then it spikes their anxiety later. Even even more. Yeah. So it's like they're probably, they they drink in the evening, but then the next day 
at three o'clock or four o'clock, they get the anxiety because it's like, whatever that thing is, that's causing that is probably just saying I need feeding. Yeah. You know, give it back to me. Right. But, um, but yeah, like, and you hear like, you know, alcohol is a part of some business deals, you know, mm-hmm. people like to yeah. you know, go and have a scotch or a whiskey. Yeah. Before they sign a contract and just loosen things up, you know, like it's, and it's it can so- be really good for social connection because sometimes we do have a hard time opening up. Like I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't drink on a first date, but I do see how alcohol could be a lubricant for getting to know somebody on an intimate level because it does allow you to sort of put your guards down. So, I think as a social tool, alcohol definitely helps people, especially who have a hard time opening up, being authentic, well, connecting and, with other people. Mine and Gemma's first date was a hot yoga class. You see, that's more my style. <laughs> right, you know? right. Yeah. But it's so weird because all of my other ones has been drinking related, but you know, a lot of the, like, it's not like you're going on a date to like, it's like you go on a date to drink but you're only drinking because you know where you want that, that date to end up. Right. Like, you know, like, well, whether you sleep with them, do you know what I mean? Like, yes. it's like, it's like, I'm just going on this date. Cause I just want to hook up. I'm not saying that that, but I'm saying yeah. that's why you would drink to say, well, okay, well, am I going to kiss this person? Am I going right. to do whatever? And it's like, well, like if someone goes, like if it's a date, it's like, I'm going to come over to my house and we'll watch movies. It's like, like, like if it is a date, then I'll bring drinking. And it's like, why are you drinking? You got to drive. And it's like, well, it's because I expect to, to stay the night. Right. So, so yeah, but no, but like, that's like a very, a very common thing. Right. So, but yeah, it's very interesting with me where um, none of that, none of, none of that is involved with, mm. with this um, that, uh, that I've got going on. So it's. Um, I mean, going know, to a hot yoga class, that is a beautiful first date because you really are stepping into vulnerability and rawness. Like, Obviously, any makeup you're wearing in a hot yoga class comes off. You're in tight clothes. You're sweaty. You're trying something really challenging. So there's a good chance that you're going to wobble, fall over, have to lay down on the mat, be completely out of breath. Like all of those things happen. And what a beautiful way to um, ignite intimacy other than to step into vulnerability. It was actually a warm yoga class because they they had all the doors open from the class before and then when we went in, then they turned the the heater on and then it was like rules still apply warm, hot, either way you can still fumble and fall and look silly. I wanted to build a place or Mm. have a place like that was uh, like a loft, but have like a little bit of a teepee in it yeah, and just sort of design something where you could go in this room in your house in the hottest part of the house just do yoga that would turn into mm, a, hot, yoga. hot yoga yeah like an attic so. yeah like an attic just go up there just come to my tent oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the daytime it's oh, definitely actually, the sauna. there's two there's two there isn't there there is yeah yeah, yeah. That, this might not make any sense to the viewers oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> no. that's um well that's a whole other story say, we depending- need a whole other podcast for that yeah i was gonna say depending on how long we've gone for it depends on if there's viewers still still tuning in at this point right. <laughs> be like, ah. but uh but yeah no uh, yeah they're quite um quite solid those those tents um are they like the glamping sort of style yeah. tents yeah. yeah and they would they were they always there they're always there for the no event. that big one is mine oh. yeah and i built the the platform for it mm. but yeah that's yeah, that's a whole other story. Yeah. But yeah. I think um you know with the subject of nutrition on the table um I think the thing that I'm the most passionate about when coming to or when discussing nutrition because I I do at the at the detox I actually think you missed that portion of the detox where I talked about nutrition. And oh food. yeah, cuz I was Should have been there the, for that. But I know, I know. You said, You'll have to come said, again. Someone said if you're late <laughs> Like if you're late, don't don't bother coming or something. Ah, uh, no, that's so I was not like true. I was running a bit late, and then that's okay. But um, you know, I only have an hour and a half to sort of dispense all of what I think is relevant about nutrition to a group of people that are in a fasted state that are coming here to essentially change their lives and potentially change their diets. Um. And I have to decide what is relevant to talk about. And with a whole lifetime, like my mom is a nutritionist. She's a professor of nutrition at a college back in Canada. 
both of my parents were triathletes. That's pretty much how they met training for that. Uh, and I've been, you know, on a whole foods diet since the day I was born. I'm born at home. Uh, my mother is very passionate about health and nutrition from a very physical, tangible standpoint, not so much into the mental health side of things, but, um, so anyways, I was born into this, plus I have a passion for it myself. So I have to basically take all those years of information, decide what's relevant to talk about, and then put it into an hour and a half discussion. And the thing that I think is the most relevant topic other than sugar, everyone's so obsessed with sugars. And that's just because we're coming from a diet culture. Like most nutrition talk is around diet and losing weight and building muscle as opposed to protecting our nervous system, our organ health, uh, longevity. Now people are starting, like Andrew Huberman is starting to discuss things like longevity, fasting, all that kind of stuff, right? But the biggest thing that I, I think everyone needs to know is about healthy fat. And the big misconception around uh, cholesterol, like animal fat, fat, fats, period, doesn't necessarily like have to. Avocados and yeah. almonds. Also, okay, so what's a healthy fat versus non-healthy fat? People need to know this. Any seed oils. Now, no one even knows what a seed oil is. What's a seed oil? Well, uh, seed oil is... No one knows. Hang, hang, can I just say yeah. what I think? Uh, yes. I've been I've been label reading a lot lately. Okay. Um, but anything with oil, whether it's sunflower, canola, seed oil, right? Yes. So, you so, know. Yeah. You know this. Right. So so yeah. So uh, seed oils. This yeah. thing. This is vegetable oil, because they vegetable oil is kind of like corn oil for the most part. They're taking like uh, the seeds of these plants and they're doing all of these different kinds of extractions. There's a bleaching process. There's a deodorizing process. There's, there's a lot of work. There's a pasteurizing process where they heat it up to 450 degrees and that makes it goes rancid and then it smells. That's why they do the deodorizing and then it has this funny color and then that's why they do the bleaching. So Canola oil, uh, rapeseed oil, rice bran oil, vegetable oil, all oils that go through an intense process, not olive oil. Hmm. Extra virgin olive oil hmm. doesn't count. That's not the seed oils I'm talking about. Um, well, they're saying that a lot of those oils are like for factory machines. They are were originally for factory machines. And then they realized shortly after that if you do all these processes to it, that you can actually cook food in it and it has no taste. So for example, when you cook stuff in butter or ghee or beef drippings, that all all of those substances, they all have a flavor. I use ghee. So which has a flavor. It it does change sort of the flavor of the, but you know, if you want to make hot chips. And you don't want them to taste like anything. Mm. Also way cheaper. They're, they they took, uh, what canola is, is a byproduct. You know how originally it was for, they were chucking that out. Then they realized that they could use it to cook food. It, originally it was just thrown out. It was a byproduct. Like, um, uh, like fluoride, right? Uh, so, no, um, not well, like fluoride. fluoride. Fluoride's a toxic waste. So they're like, what are we going to do with it? We can't landfill it. So it's like, let's yeah, but it's it. also used for things like, uh, Dumb you, down the you, <laughs> okay. One, one, one thing at a time. Okay. So oils, we're talking about oils. Yeah. So, okay. So the canola oil plant in itself, the way that it grows, bugs don't eat it. It's a poisonous plant. Canola plant is poisonous. Then they do all those processes to it that also make it another kind of poisonous. Now there's a whole other ball game to this as well, that seed oils have an imbalance in their omegas. And now this is really important to understand. Mm -hmm. They have one to six ratio, omega three to omega six. Our omega three to six ratio is supposed to be one to one or six to six. It's supposed to be completely balanced 50, 50. Yeah. We're all frying our foods in oil that is not only rancid and technically comes from a poisonous plant and has been bleached and deodorized and all of this, 
but also its very fundamental nutrient profile is completely out of balance to what we need. Now, cooking in ghee, butter, grass-fed beef drippings, this is really important, grass-fed beef drippings, grass-fed ghee will have a ratio of three to six. This is good, okay? Now, a fair question would be, well, why do we not want an imbalance in our omegas? What happens if we have one to six? Well, having a one to six ratio in your omegas blocks your body's ability to absorb vitamin D and vitamin K. Okay, what is every Australian, Canadian, American deficient in? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. Now, if our vitamin D and vitamin then K is blocked, vitamin D is actually a hormone. Would you say it like Australians and Americans? Or I thought. Oh, ninety-five percent of West. I don't know about the other countries, um, but ninety-five percent of Americans. That's the only stat I know. I don't know an Australian stat, but I would assume it's very similar. Are have this in, omega imbalance. Now, what happens when your body can't absorb vitamin D? Vitamin D is actually a hormone. When one hormone is out of balance, all your hormones are out of balance. So we are essentially giving people foods cooked in oil that is making them unable to absorb vitamin D then unable to absorb vitamin K and then unable to have a balanced hormone profile because when the vitamin D goes up or down, it affects testosterone, it affects estrogen, it affects our entire system and also affects our immune system and that abil its ability to function. So on so many levels, we have been told that fat is not good, but actually the reality of that is that Fat is a, a fundamental nutrient that we need for brain health, recovery, muscle function, bone density, everything. But we just need proper fats, the right kinds of fats. And fat has gotten a really bad reputation because everyone's fat is all skewed and out of whack because we're all consuming freaking vegetable oil and canola oil. And when I say we're all consuming it, I mean everything you eat at a restaurant has been made in canola oil. Yeah. All the salad dressings, the steak, the lasagna, whatever you order, it's made in vegetable or canola oil. Everything you go to a nice restaurant, it's very, very rare that they will use anything other than that because it's just too expensive. Mm -hmm. And then, not to mention it being put in all of those foods that we're eating from the supermarket oh, with it's labels. Everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. You know? People don't know what to worry about. You can literally, if you eat a whole foods diet, you can literally eat butter and be healthy not have your cortisol levels go up court or not sorry cortisol uh, cholesterol do, levels do you think this is somewhat by design oh yeah for sure it's way cheaper and we want to why why not make money off of a byproduct well, if they can I, I also mean like by design not to make people sick but to in a way no, no it's all about business i it's all about business and you know what sick people are good business addicted people are good business you know, people that are healthy and not addicted and strong and resilient, that's not good business. The whole system is designed by that type of business. And it's like, for me in my industry, you know, it's like being a motor mechanic, well, I'm not a motor mechanic, but it's like being a motor mechanic that like at nighttime, like, you know, at the end of somebody's street, he has like a, a, a mechanic store and he goes into that street and at nighttime it's like breaks everyone's motors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or it's like the drug dealer. And I, you know, I'm from, I, you know, I was raised downtown Toronto. So I, I, you know, I've seen some dodgy things in my life. Um, there's literally a tactic where drug dealers will give people who are not on drugs, free drugs to get them addicted. It's a, a worthy investment to give somebody a hundred dollars of crack if they're going to be a lifelong investor. So it, this is kind of like a business tactic, a very dodgy one, but yeah. And this is, um, it's in the foods. It's, uh, 
Sure. And people think that they're like rebellious and independent. I'm like, if you're consuming canola oil and processed food, you are a slave to the system. If you cannot control what's going in your mouth and coming out of it, you have a problem. Yeah. I um, done some label reading the other day through the, well, have you heard of, um, I can't think of it. His, his name's Paul something. I can't pronounce his last name, but he's the kind not of- Not normally good at names. Carnival just... MD. He's a carnival MD um you, you've probably seen him about but he yeah, goes okay. into shopping centers and he talks about oils and all these things so anyway, yeah okay cool. so, so 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 i was like oh, i'll put it to the test and i'll see like i'll just go on label read because in some countries of europe they don't have the same ingredients but in america they've got different ingredients you know and, and they don't always have to list their ingredients yeah, either yeah, yeah so it's, like fragrance if you see fragrance fragrance has its own like they put that but they're buying, that's because, okay, say I'm making this product, right? Mm. I'm making this jar of whatever good stuff. And I go to you and I need fragrant or I need um, a flavoring or, uh, you know, uh, I need to make this taste like banana or whatever. So I'll go to you and I'll get that, that product that I only have to list on my product, your ingredient, but your ingredient has an ingredient list of its own. Mm. Yeah. So, so ingredient lists are actually not, it's not just about even reading labels sometimes. Sometimes it's even deeper than that. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that they don't have to list, like canola oil. They don't even have to list that they've put it through a deodorizing process. They don't need to list that they've put it to 450 degrees and now it's rancid and actually even more poisonous than it originally was. They don't have to list any of that. Mm. But the one thing that you can pretty much guarantee is that if you're eating anything that's a product that has a label with many ingredient lists that basically it could be tainted. There, there's some point along the way that something could have happened to that food when it went to farmer to plate that they don't have to reveal. Well, you see that in a lot, a lot of packaging these days. It says also may contain this, 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 this. May contain, yeah. may, you know. Sometimes that's because it's made in the same factory as something. So not the same thing? Be. No, like, uh, you know, if I make a product in a factory and right next to me making these crackers, I'm also making tofu. Sometimes there's cross-contamination. So they have to, if it's made in the same factory. They have to list may contain yeah. soy. Uh, That's when, normally what they say. I don't, I've never worked in a factory. I only know what I know through word of mouth. Yeah, I think, I think that um, Australians should take a tour through like the, the back doors of Woolworths and Coles just to figure out where's everything coming from? You know, what, what, what are we eating here? But um, I, I went through the sort of like the, um, like the nutri, uh, the nutrigrain aisle, you know, where all the bars are and stuff like that. Oh, those are and, all and, fucked. Don't oh, eat this, those. <laughs> I, I, I picked up like an organic box and I think it was like, like a Still. kid's school lunch thing. Yep. And it was like organic and no. I read it no. and I was like organic oil, no. organic this, organic that. Organic sugar. But it was meant to be organic flavoring. It was meant to be a banana bar and there was nothing. Like there's no bananas. No, it's it like all commercial. Organic banana flavoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, don't be fooled. Health, uh, you know, health food. Again, their get, businesses, they're trying to get you addicted. And if they can tap into a market where they can be like low calorie, mm. zero sugar, blah, 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 blah. That's another way to sell you, get you addicted. To, because then if you're reading that labor, label and maybe you are starting to be more health conscious, you're not going to feel guilty. Like, buying it again so they're like tricking you in just in a different way anything with a label you need to scrutinize hardcore everything from the produce section is good even eating genetically modified foods isn't the end of the world like people think so that G, you, don't, you don't think gmo or that bad? i do i do but i think if you're going to give something up before you give up uh ge genetically modified foods you need to give up the oil in all and the and the products that you're buying with the ingredient lists like there's no point in eating all organic produce if you have preservatives you in your diet. I won't eat the, the watermelon that they're selling. Oh, because it doesn't have seeds? Uh, well, it's got the little white ones, which, you know. Um, I've noticed... I mean, most, more, most fruits you can't really get organic. The, that, well, it, it, it surprised me the other day. I went into the shops and it was like organic bananas. I'm like, oh, what are these? Oh, yeah. What I mean, if they're in season for sure, but the, the abundance in which 
we eat fruit and even food, it's like, if you're really living in season and eating organic, you'd be surprised kind of how limited your diet would be. Like sometimes I just eat salad and chicken yeah. every day of the week. It's very boring. So what is the GMO? <laughs> are they G like, are some bananas GMO? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when we say GMO, I mean, most bananas, are when we say GMO, this is not a a natural seed this is almost like an engineered yeah sort of genetically modified yeah like uh, you go into a lot of the salmon and there was i seen like this documentary on uh, in like norway or something like that where like a lot of the the waterways were just full of you know algae and all of this shit mm -hmm. but the one of the common ones here is tassel which is the um uh, uh tasmanian it's Tasmanian salmon, but it's like, it's like wild caught Tasmanian salmon or, or some form. Right. But, um, Woolworth sells this tassel and it's made in like little Tupperware containers. It's not, it's not like out, like it's not, you know, uh, the babies aren't coming out in the ocean, right? It's they're, they're creating them or, or making them mm. um, or birthing them or borning them, whatever, like in a, a Tupperware container on a shelf in like this big storage warehouse mm -hmm. and then it starts to like grow a little bit and then they'll put it in like you know like a little fish tank thing and then they pull it out of the fish tank and then they'll put it in like a like an above ground swimming pool size and then i pull it out of that and then they go and dump it into the ocean well you know? well and, um, and, and sorry and and the tassel one is uh, an environmental disaster through this little harbor port thing mm. in um, in Hobart or somewhere in Tasmania, I'm not too sure exactly where it is, but it's become an environmental disaster because it's like this channel where water is meant to come through into mm. this bay. All of the fit, like the fish, uh, little growing parts of it, like they're all pooing and, and stuff like that, where it's not flowing out into the ocean. So it's mm -hmm. just contaminating all of this water yeah. becoming a problem. Right. And, and this is, this is on the shelf and it's, it's not real and not many people know. Yeah. Well, uh, the fishing industry is really, uh, you know, taking a hard hit. Mm. Um, there's, I mean, if you were a fisherman 10 years ago, your profits were a lot, a lot better. Your job was a lot easier. Um, but the ocean is definitely depleted of fish and fish farming is actually the worst, um, industry for the environment it, out of you know, people talk about cows being bad for the environment. I'm like, cows are only bad for the environment when they're eating grain. When they're grass fed, they're very good for the environment. It means big paddocks um, are left open for grazing. Uh, but when we have to grow, like monocrop, grow uh, corn and wheat, whatever um, whatever cows eat, when we have to monocrop and destroy ecosystems in order to feed our cattle, that's when things like cowspiracy makes sense. But if you're eating grass-fed beef, not only is it better for you because of those omegas I talked about, which I don't think I actually explained fully, that when the cow eats the grain, that genetically modified grain that's out of balance, the cow itself is then also out of balance, one to six ratio of the omegas. So then if you eat that cow, it's the same it's the same as eating the canola oil. So you have to make sure that whatever oils you're using that come from a cow are grass-fed. Um, duck, duck fat can also be used and you don't have to get grass-fed duck <laughs> because- um, So what is duck fat? Like what, what is Just the basically the cooking with fats that, the best way that I can explain it is- um, Fat off a duck's body. So the, there's an amazing cardiologist uh, from Florida, uh, Dr. Pradeep Jamandas, and he is a radical speaker. He's so knowledgeable and he really just puts it, he really speaks passionately, passionately about the fact that we're all just addicts mm. for sugar. And uh, a lot of the things that I'm talking about, I, I, I'm sort of... Uh, repeating from his teachings, his lectures, which are all available on YouTube. And I highly recommend if you're interested in nutrition to go check him out because he's incredibly knowledgeable. But um, what's his name? Uh, Pradeep Jamandas. I'm not going to know how to talk. <laughs> Pradeep. P-R-A-D-I-P. Uh, Pradeep. And then Jamandas is J A M A N D A S. Oh, I'm subscribed. 
He's epic. I've done a few blog posts on my website. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I know this guy. Yeah, he's awesome. And he speaks about how people are addicted to sugars. And um, he also speaks about this ratio that I'm talking about. So grass-fed. Oh, so when we cook with duck fat, any any fats that could have we could have had a hundred years ago mm -hmm. are pretty much safe. So the fats that we used to cook in a hundred years ago was butter, mm -hmm. ghee. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know what ghee is. It's clarified butter. So if you take butter and you put it into a pot and you boil that, the milk solids will rise to the surface. You skim them off, and you're left with this foundation, this oil, mm -hmm. which. I believe is lactose free, but I also know some people who are lactose intolerant that can have ghee. So um, don't mark my words on whether or not it's 100% for people who are lactose intolerant to take it, but essentially it doesn't have any of the lactose left in it. Mm. Uh, so this existed 100 years ago. Mm. Um, same with duck fat, same with beef drippings, all of this stuff. It's only when we get into using sort of like these modern day fats that are processed, highly toxic, not only bad for you, but also bad for the environment and um, put your entire system out of whack. Like uh, I go to a cafe in the morning and I know for a fact that if I get scrambled eggs, they're going to be cooked in canola oil. So I get poached eggs because they're boiled. I get bacon, even though bacon has preservatives in it, which you should probably stay away from if you're being really particular, but sometimes I like to splurge. Ooh, crazy. And I have bacon. You know why? Because I'd rather the preservatives in the bacon and the sodium in the bacon than the canola oil in my eggs. So I'll get bacon because I don't use oil to cook the bacon because it has its own fat. I'll get steamed spinach. Totally cool. Sourdough bread. Totally cool. Um, e but roasted or, or sauteed mushrooms will be cooked in oil. So I don't get that. So I literally will still go out to a restaurant, but I have to be very specific with how I order and what I order mm. because I am very much avoiding canola oil at all costs. And that's not because of fat. That's because I just want to be healthy. And I know that this is a key link to hormonal imbalances and hormonal imbalances support mental health. And everything that I do really in my life is trying to become as mentally healthy and stable as possible because I understand that everything else flows from that space. And that's why I don't have these like very tight restrictions around what I do and do not do. That's why I don't not drink or never smoke or never do drugs or never eat burgers. I do everything a little bit because I feel like flexibility is an important skill to have when you're trying to keep a balanced mindset yeah so i think um in 10 years 20 years we'll start to see the effects of these oils because i feel like it's oh we uh, already are yeah are they is it something that's newly like what well, i feel that I feel I mean, like there was a study done in india mm. you could probably find it on your laptop right now mm -hmm. about 20 years ago they introduced canola oil and they started convincing like billboards were put up convincing people that the healthier option for oil was canola oil and people stopped using ghee and they started using canola oil thinking it was superior heart disease rise i don't know what the number is but it's a ridiculous number that makes your mind just go they already know. The industry knows. Scientists knows. Doctors know. Canola oil. Well, maybe not. Actually, Canola maybe not all doctors. Oil. I take that back. <laughs> A study done in India uh, transitioning from ghee, cooking with ghee to vegetable oil or canola oil. You know, I don't, you're not going to be able to go through it. <laughs> I don't even know what I've done. No, what I mean, it might pop up though. Uh, Slicking salad um i was gonna say like, like i feel like it was like we've all just been asleep and we woke up you should put you should put um a connection uh, a link between heart disease and canola oil in india maybe it will come up there link between uh canola, canola oil, oil yep. and heart disease study in india study there we go in india it's coming up because we're not the only ones have who have searched it 
three may oh can you scroll down to that um may cut heart disease. see okay so remember how i said here it says canola oil with omega-3 uh, may cut heart disease risk this is very interesting because what i was just explaining was that when omega-3s are at one and omega-6 are at six mm. And it should be one to one. Mm -hmm. So if we can balance out our omega threes, if we can intake just omega three up our omega threes, then that sort of balances it out, lowering our risk for heart disease. So this is very interesting. Yeah, it just popped up. Yeah, very um, cool. What was I going to say? I was going to say, um, yeah, like I feel like it was like just overnight. It's like this ingredient that they've just slid into our foods while we weren't paying any sort of attention. And mm -hmm. like I, I was trying to find just actual just normal butter the other day um and uh i'm label reading just for butter like just trying to find something with without canola oil mm, um and fine with butter or but it's, in, butter. it's in every, it's i used to have the nut licks or nut licks that's not butter i know i know i know that's canola oil i know i know um but i don't have it anymore vegans so, get, get rid of that nut, nut, do something for yourself <laughs> vegans don't do nut alex olive oil salt a little bit of rub of garlic on toast get rid of the nut 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 alex nut alex yeah, yeah. and there's so many of them I, there's one there that's like for cholesterol and oh my oh my oh my god do you know how difficult it is to have this information in your mind and walk through the grocery store <laughs> how, how about this how about this right if you had torture if, if you had eight billion people in the world and you were selling a butter that was going to fix something that causes, you know, like a, a like cholesterol, mm. and you you had the cure. Well, you're limited to the available amount, right? Because if you're gonna if you're gonna eliminate cholesterol by using this butter, then you can only produce so many tubs. You know what I mean? So it's like you're probably giving it to people that you know to make you like further buy it right so oh um but now i look at all I, i've been getting like the hardened the hardened block not not the ones in the in the packet so there's there's probably like only two or three that you can um choose from that that have like say 80. what do you mean two or three what butters no in the in the wrapper in the in the square block wrapper not in the package yeah, but what is in the packet what is in the wrapper the butter you're talking about yeah, butter. Yeah, the type of butter yeah so if you look at that it'll go like 80 percent from something to do with milk or whatever and then like you know something with cream or or, or whatever it is but mm. it, but there's nothing added in it but right. you go throughout, you know, like the flora and all of the other brands of, I can't believe it's not butter or whatever. Like but all you of this. understand that those are not butter. No, I know. But I know that. So you can't compare not Alex to butter. They're different. No, I get, no, I get different. that. But even what we're picking up, thinking it is butter. Or right. Even, do, do you know what I mean? So we're, right. so I'm trying to <laughs> find butter. Right. And you're not really sure what is butter. butter and what is not I'm butter. In the butter aisle. I got you. I'm in, I'm in the butter aisle. You're in the butter aisle and you're looking at all these options and you think that they're all butter. Trying to avoid. Right. Oil, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's there's only like a few of them. And and they're in that hardened. Remember like when you were a kid and your parents would bring out fucking like butter and like a square yeah. block and be hard to put holes in your brain. They're not in a tub. <laughs> butter doesn't come yeah. in a tub. Yeah. 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 Well, it's like um that kind of OMD. He's like, you know, put butter on this, butter on that, and he would just eat the yeah, butter. Yeah, you can yeah. just eat butter. Mm. Like, okay, so obviously these things sort of change if if I'm eating all preserved food and processed food and then I eat a stick of butter, obviously no, 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 not good. Don't do that. But if you're eating a whole like people think uh, they're so uh when you switch to like this healthy diet, clean eating, people think that they can give up everything that's great. If you don't give yourself the right amount of butter, you will have cravings and you're having cravings because your body is actually depleted in nutrient. You need fats to function for your brain to function, for your heart health to be good. So we're, we're supposed to have fat in our diet. The idea that you can just eat fruits and vegetables and then never have any fat, you're just going to be battling cravings. Your body is not going to be sustained. You're going to be hungry more often. And then you might even have some issues like health concerns arise because your body's not really able to, like fat works as like the lubrication of the system. You know, your joints 
it sounds too, too basic to be so simple, you know, but it really is like the grease to your body. Hmm. So, so what I'm saying is that there's a lot of things to give up in life. A lot of things that you, you don't really want in, in your, in your diet. Butter is not one of them. Ghee is not one of them. Even, um, olive oil, as long as you don't cook with it, totally. Eat the fat off your steak. Mm, I've been doing that lately. Yeah. If you have veggies, you can have a big chunk of butter. Have as much butter as you want. It's just not feasible if you're also going to go and have like ice cream and chips and pizza right after eating that stick of butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, it's almost like saying, don't fast for 24 hours. If you're going to eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can really mess yourself up. I mean, people think that fasting is the dangerous part. The only thing dangerous about fasting. A lot of people think that Shane Warne died from the crazy fast. Who's that? Shane Warne, the cricketer. I have no idea. I don't, I don't, yeah, that, do that I look said, like I watch cricket? <laughs> I don't watch cricket. So <laughs> everyone knows who Shane Warne is, but he, it, look, we, we know really how he died. Um, I but, don't know who's we. I've never even heard of this person. Well, um, maybe don't tell me. He was over in Thailand, and um, he uh, look. I'll show you this. Um, shame. Yeah, the only shame. thing unhealthy about fasting is if you eat shit food coming out of a fast. Then you can really get insulin resistance and a bunch of a bunch of other things that sort of happen. Died sixty. Heart attack. Heart attack, not fasting, though. No, no, no. But some people saying that he was doing this crazy celebrity diet, which is like fasting for so long and da da da, da. But there's multiple um, things around his death. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's if you're doing extreme stuff and you haven't built up to it slowly, yeah, you can, yeah, you can have uh, reactions for sure. Yeah. Uh, diet of, coronary artery, whatever that last word is, atherosclerosis. But, you know, how, how did you have to get into, th into Thailand back in 2022? You needed to present a, um, a medical certificate of some sort. So uh, anyway. Yeah. An Aussie legend folks it. Mm. An athlete. So, so yeah. um before we, even athletes can have heart attacks yeah, you can look that's the whole thing with this canola canola oil and preservatives is that like you're you can look fit and have a six-pack your organs are absolutely destroyed your adrenals are destroyed and um just a lot of pressure on the system sometimes that's my biggest my biggest thing is definitely my diet my diet my training and, and uh -uh. the insulin mm -mm. and all of this stuff what's the real issue if we've learned anything today, a mindset. Mm, there we go. <laughs> there we go. At least we've learned something. No, but but you know, okay. Here, here we think. Before we wrap this up, yeah. If you if you could leave, like, some if you could leave some sort of, sort of like decent information in a way of something that some people should know. Like, what is what is like a, a not like a tip, but like if you could leave something to say you know that you think could benefit somebody anybody or something you found majority are struggling with etc if you could just leave something like what would that be mm. it's not your fault mm. it's really not your fault in order to break these habits you are fighting multi-billion dollar corporations it takes an incredible amount of determination and strength. And you may be completely alone in that battle at times. And can I, title, can I title this? It's not your fault. Yeah, sure. Go. Keep going. Yeah, it's not your fault. Like you're you're addicted and it's not your fault. You're not not disciplined. You're not weak. You are just addicted. I used to think I couldn't keep or maintain a diet. 
And I used to have these thoughts that I'm not disciplined, that I'm not strong. I'm just not good with consistency. I had all of these internalizations around why I couldn't maintain certain choices long term. But it's because no one ever explained to me that I am addicted, not just addicted to food, but addicted to thinking, addicted to narratives, addicted to my own excuses, my own bullshit. Um, but again, it's not your fault. It is your responsibility, though. If you want to live a good life, if you want to feel different, the only person that can change that is you. And if you really want to make it easy for yourself, you go to the root, and the root is the mindset. If you want to always be struggling back and forth, you'll go and try to micromanage your diet and your routine. We all find it in a different way. Sometimes it's a little bit of both. Sometimes you do need to do the diet to support the mindset. And sometimes you need to support the mindset to do the diet. But both my parents were triathletes. Both my parents are very knowledgeable. And, you know, my mother struggles with addiction to this day. Not because she doesn't know that cigarettes and alcohol are bad for her because she emotionally has not done the work and therefore she's always going to be a victim to her feelings. Yeah. No one chooses addiction. That includes shopping addiction. Was that includes no one chooses addiction unless they, their regular state of being is, sh is shittier than the side effects of addiction. No one chooses that. If you feel good every day of the week and then you drink and you feel hung, hung over, you're going to be like, wow, I never want to do that because I feel good every other day. But if you feel shit every day, what's the difference? It's just one more shitty feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. With that whole addiction thing, it's uh, we, we tell ourselves that we want to stop, but we're not in control. And it's almost like, I don't want to do this. Like I'm, I, I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I'm sick of living like this. I'm sick of living this life. Why do I always not have any money? Why do I not have friends around me? Like, why, mm -hmm. why, why? It's like, I, I don't want to be like this. I want to be living like everyone else. And it, it, it's, it's something where you say that to yourself, but you, you can't do it. Right. Cause there's, there's a programming behind it. And it's, 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 it's how you're brought up. It's just how you were taught as a kid and all of these things, you know, that's tied into the subconscious where it's like, um, it's like, you just got no control over yourself. And, and it's just as simple as saying, well, I'm just going to stop, but it's like all of this other stuff just overcomes. And it's like, you just go back to that, the comfort of knowing that this is all I need to do. Right. And we're, we're living in this state where we can be anyone we want in this world. We can, we can live like Brad Pitt. We can be Brad Pitt. We can be actors. We can, we can do anything, but we're choosing to, to live this life where we don't know any better. And there is a small secret out there, you know, and some of us know the secret, some of us, some of us don't, but it's like, you've got to break that regular pattern or that regular cycle that you are that you're living just to see that there's actually another version over there. There's another version of self on the other side. Mm. So, yeah, I, I I believe that you can meditate your weight away. You can meditate your weight away. Imagine that. Just not that everyone's trying to lose weight, but a lot of people are. And if you were to tell the average person that you can meditate your weight away, they'd think you're crazy, right? Is that a way of like just aligning yourself with? Yeah. yeah in, if in you a feel good. You feel good. You're not going to binge eat. You're not going to drink alcohol. You're not going to turn to drugs. You're not going to eat unhealthy food that makes you feel like shit. If you feel good, your body will seek more of that same feeling. You're not going to want to escape that. You're, it's like once you find bliss, it's hard to, it's like hard to go back to non-bliss. I remember in 
2021, I ran a running event called the Lara Pinta Trail, mm. which was a stage race in Northern Territory. And, and I had to train for it. And I remember my morning practice was to visualize and meditate, and manifest being fit or athletic or to look a certain way. And it's probably the only time once did I ever use my, like, how would I like to see myself where I was visualizing how I'd like to see myself, where I put in that time and effort to make it a part of my morning practice, mm -hmm. where I actually, you know, brought it into, into play or into reality. Right? So, um, so yeah, so it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, you can lose weight to meditate or meditate to lose weight. However you, however you put it, but, but I get it. Um, well, I think like maybe the idea of like your desire, I would, I would probably maybe want to look into that, like your desire to be healthy. Like what is the underlying emotion that you're associating with a fit body? Um, like, do you, because the reality is, is like, say you got that fit body, that perfect eight pack, that 5% body fat, and you're just absolutely jacked. Do you really think that's the end goal? Do you really think that that's the highest point that you could get to? Because the reality is, is you can look that way and still be miserable and still be sad and struggling and lost and unloved and lonely. So if your goal is to look good and have an eight pack, I feel like it's not a high enough goal. The goal should be to feel fucking great, to feel, and a lot of times when people want a, uh, an eight pack or a body, they're, they want to be desirable. They want to be liked. They want to seem powerful. They want to seem in control. So there's so many other emotions that come with being fit that we can strive to without expecting the body to look a certain way. And what's interesting is if we embrace all of those feelings, the body changes. The body will adapt to that mindset. So we can force the body to be fit and strong and sidestep the mindset. But that will be a constant struggle. If we just look at the mindset and we dive into that world, how can we make ourselves feel all those things? Then the body will, will follow. The, the, the fit body is a byproduct of the healthy mind. Yeah. You can get it the other way around. There's a lot of people with a fit body and unhealthy mind, but they are struggling and it's almost like a waste of a healthy body. Because they look good, but they're lonely. They can attract girls, but they can't keep them but, and vice versa. Yeah. Like really sexy girls that can't hold a conversation, that don't trust anyone. Okay. Yeah. They have all the guys looking at them. But then once you get to know that girl and she's like toxic as fuck, she's lonelier than, she's just as lonely, if not more lonely than the, the fat chick. So you can meditate your weight away. That's it. That's <laughs> no, Mindset it. over body. <laughs> it's interesting because I've heard like um, a UFC fighter, John Jones, talk about, um, I think it was like 2010, 2013, he understood and realized how powerful his mind actually was, where mm. he just started to tell himself that this is what he was. And the same with Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson's trainer. He's told awesome. Him, told him he was a, he was a, a champion mm. enough until he believed he was a champion to become the champion. Mm. And you know what? what? Even when he became a champion, Mike Tyson will be the first to say that that wasn't him in his greatest form. His greatest form is actually him as a father, husband, somebody who's uh, not driven by ego. Like who he is now today is actually much more superior and powerful than the man he was when he won his title. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think, that's a, I think that's a wrap. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> I'm just, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I'm actually starving too. I haven't, yeah. I haven't eaten no more. Me neither. What time is it? We've had ice baths. We've done a workout. It's Red two o'clock. I'm buzzing. You see, you don't need food to feel vibrant. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. where are we? We are here. Till next time. Till next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Took, um, two months to sort of what are we, March was it early January. We're going to try and do it like the 8th of January or something. Or no, you had your retreat. For what? What are you doing? I feel like we we're going to do this 
at the beginning of January. So, so oh yeah, so, but so it's like good that it's now. Ago. I'm much more relaxed. So look, awesome. how long was that? I don't know. It wasn't timing. Oh, but it doesn't show you on the record. Oh, uh, well, okay. we're out.